Hello. Greetings. This is my best greeting I can come up with. My name is Carl. I'm from Obsidian. Um, uh, yeah, we're a sponsor. In no, in no, in no way that, that I get the slot because we're the sponsor. Uh, this was this was organised a long time ago. If you have an issue with it, please address it with with Yaku or Malcolm. Cool. So a quick thank you uh, to them, and then uh, my precious team. They're there at the back. Hello, I love you. Uh, Thank you for letting me come up here and talk crap. Um, the Linux Conf organizers, you guys are amazing. Thank you for having these events. It's very important. Uh, we used to have a lot of Software Freedom Days uh, over the last X amount of time, but unfortunately, Software Freedom Day usually happens on my wedding anniversary, and then my wife says, I need to, I need to decide what is important, free software or me. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a, that's a hard one. <laughs> Because obviously software is stable, um, so okay. <laughs> I'm in so much trouble. Uh, okay, and then thank you, thank you for you, right? So I want you to quickly stand up, and just shake someone's hand that's around you, because this is what it's about, right? This is community. So stand up, stand up. This is real. Stand up. Quickly shake someone's hand that you don't know and introduce yourself. Yeah. So many cool things. Excellent. Yeah. That wasn't hard. It's like, yeah. It's like a dating buzz, just speed dating. Right? Cool. So 20 years ago, this is a very important week for me. 20 years ago, in 1999, I was 18. Still, un yeah, yeah, lots of words. I was 18. And on the 2nd of October, um, I decided, it's the day after my 18th birthday, I decided now I'm a man, right? Now everything is going to change. I'm going to do something phenomenal. And I had a friend uh, that was crashing over uh, that night at my house. His name is Derek Swanepoel. Some of you might know him. He's overseas now, but he was, he was involved in the Linux community for a long time. And uh, we, we whacked a machine and we installed Red Hat 5.3 or 5.2 on that machine and said that day I'll switch to Linux. And that was the day I switched to Linux. Very important day for me. And I, based on that, um, yeah, changed my life, right? So that's me with a computer. And uh, July that year, my dad gave me a book, that book, right? about mastering Linux, and then, yeah, proceeded to immigrate to Perth without telling me. What a loser. Anyway, love you, Dad. Anyway, so, <laughs> so fundamental in the Linux community is something that we do often. I don't know if you've heard this term, distro hopping. I don't know if you've changed distros ever before, um, right? It's, it's, it's crazy. Some people might have started out using something like Debian or Red Hat Linux or SUSE. This is the old logos, guys, so I know. 100% that I'm wrong. Mandrake, Mandrake logo. I don't know if any of you know that. Gen 2, remember that one? CentOS, Ubuntu, Arch, whatever, elementary, right? And fundamental to who we are as a community is something that's consistent is that we change. We move around. If something doesn't work, we change, right? Editors, editors, anybody? Emacs, is anybody still in Emacs? I'm joking. Um, we use GNOME, we use KDE, we use Window Maker, and then we switch back to GNOME. It's, it's one of those things. Change is fundamental, but there's one thing that is consistent with the way that we interact with our machines. And that is, oh, remember this? Maybe it's before your time. Remember that? Ooh, that was the glory days, and now this. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so, right? Change. Everything happens. Everything's changing. X.org, X11. Remember that? Wayland, Mir. <laughs> Everything changed. We love change, right? Because everything is about choice. And fundamental to that choice is because everything is open, right? Open. You can switch. You can use what you want. You can do what you want. It's amazing. And, but remember, we have a lot of freedom today. But in the old days, like 2000s, it wasn't always like that, right? It wasn't like this. Remember uh, this guy when he was still something, right? Um, is like, yeah, who can afford to do it? Sorry, I don't have my notes because this is Windows. Um, 
So who can, yeah, who can afford to do professional work for nothing? What hobby, hobbyist can spend three man years into programming, finding all bugs, documenting his product, and distribute it for free? This was in 1976, right? So this was the attitude that people usually saw about Linux in the early 2000s, right? Linux is not in the public domain. Linux is a cancer that attaches itself in an intellectual property sense to everything it touches. That's the way that the license works, right? Steve Ballmer um, was the CEO of a company. So um, that was, he was the CEO of Microsoft at that time, if you might not know. Um, Microsoft had a very strong stance at that point about what Linux is supposed to be. And this is not, in no means a bashing session. We're not going to bash Microsoft today. The whole thing of this is how worldviews adjust and change over time, right? Based on money. Uh, well, not just money, but facts. And I said, yeah. So obviously, he said Linux is not, a, uh, not in the public domain. So, and then we have to say, don't you mean GNU Linux, Steve? No, anyway. So, so yeah, so these things were, were there, and this was the pitch of the main of the early 2000s, like, yeah, Linux is communism, and if the talks ever get distributed, there's links to all these things. Um, yeah, Microsoft argues that open source freezes innovation, right? Think of this and where they're at today. It's like, you can't, you can't actually believe that, and then that's a link to the article down there as well, right? So it's story time. I was, uh, I was sitting at dinner with a family member the one time, this lady, and she's like, yeah, so what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm like, yeah, I want to be in free software, open source, yeah, and how do you get it? You know, you download it for free. And she's like, how are you going to make a living of something that's free? Well, okay, I think most of you, who's making a living out of open source today? Free software, anything, support services around it, who uses it as a tool to get stuff done? Okay, who uses Android? Raise your hand. Okay, done deal, great. <laughs> cool. And then, then here in, uh, let's just get that date right, 2002, like IBM makes this big announcement that they are going to invest a billion dollars in Linux in 2001, 2002 year. Amazing, amazing. And they'll make an investment later on again. Um, <laughs> we will get that to that slide, right? There's another company, Novell. So uh, early 2000s, Microsoft and Novell rule the scene. There's this other company called Sun, but they are too idealistic for anybody, and they like disintegrate later on, right? So Novell acquires a company called Zimian. Who knows Zimian? Who's ever used Evolution on their Linux desktop? Yeah, the guys from Zimian used to make that. Um, and yeah, so Novell acquired them, and there was two guys there that's very instrumental to the open source movement in that time, a guy called Nat Friedman and Miguel de Alcaza. Just remember those names for later on. But yeah, they, they go on and do some other cool things, right? And also in the early 2000s, Fedora gets released, right? This, in the old days, it was just Red Hat. Then that spun up into Fedora and other processes and things, oh, well, other Linux distributions as well. So, if you look at the early 2000s, it's really the formative years of where we're heading into the, where we're at now. So Fedora was there, right? Novell competes the acquisition of SUSE Linux. Shame they've had more owners than um, anything, you know? So poor guys. So that, that acquisition, year 2004, Red Hat says, yeah, there's 10,000 RHCEs in the market. 2004, great, great time to be alive. You're not an MCSE. You're still something that matters, right? Sorry, that's not a diss. Um, that's, that's the truth. Um, so, uh, so yeah, over 750 applications now certified on RHEL, and that was in 2004, right? So there's a consistent buildup through the 2000s to do stuff, right? So, and I think this is where something pivotal happened, right? Where CentOS got released, right? So and that's in 14th May, 2004. This sets us up probably for the next 10 years, where a commercially viable enterprise community distribution gets released for free. And there's a lot of companies out there who use a CentOS or some kind of version of RHEL that's running. I'm not, I'm not talking about Oracle Linux. Anybody from Oracle here? Dodge the bullet. <laughs> right, yeah. So uh, not, not talking about that, but uh, some kind of a RHEL derivative. Who uses CentOS or Ubuntu CentOS? Yeah, there's a lot of people that use a CentOS. I think that's pivotal, and people use that still to this day because it's stable and it works. Uh, okay. <laughs> right, so yeah. And then, then this is a very important event, and I'm not expecting you to read the whole article. 
but the headline says, yeah, Novell gets $350 million uh, from Microsoft. And this was a patent agreement cross-licensing thing that happened in the early 2000s. Very controversial thing. Very controversial thing. Because at that stage, people didn't know where those two entities stood, and there was a lot of people with patents regarding Unix and TCP stacks and magical things like that, like IPX networks, forever. OK. Ah, these guys. Can you believe they're 13 years old already? AWS got started in 2006. And, and to a certain extent, if you look at the, the dominance of what CentOS brought and the ability to, to have something like that in the cloud, it became kind of a game changer at that point. So that, that was pretty much cloud 1.0. That was VMs in, in space, right? Yeah, VMs in the sky. That was, that was just basically what <laughs> that was at that point. And now, I don't know how many services somebody who uses AWS tell me how many services AWS has, like a thousand? And that was just released last week, you know? So it's crazy. So yeah, 2007, uh, South African government goes open source. That didn't work um, <laughs> very well. We're still trying to fight the battle, but that's more on a policy level. And also in the 2000s, yeah, a company called GitHub got founded, also 11 years ago. So yeah, there's still, still a lot of things here. And then obviously the, this thing called Android, which nobody uses, right? So also in that early stages. So the, Linux was really everywhere, but not in your face at that point. People didn't know, I don't know how to put it, but it wasn't really like a commodity at that point where people could just do it. It was just us, the, the patriots. Are you allowed to use that with Donald Trump ruining that word? But we're the people, the zealots, the lovers of open source that, that can do that thing, right? So yeah, 2010 is very interesting. Things take a really, really, really interesting twist at this point. So yeah, Microsoft Azure got founded, 1st of February 2010, right? So already there's already competitiveness in the cloud market, right? And we're going to evaluate a few things here. And you can see here at the bottom, it says, yeah, licenses, closed source for platform and open source for client SDKs and things like that. But obviously, things, things evolve and customer needs change over time. So the 4th of February 2014, important day, um, Satya Nadella became uh, the CEO of Microsoft, and we started things changing again in the industry, right? People change their views. Why do people change their views? Otherwise, they die. <laughs> We're not going to eat this anymore. We will die. And then you stop eating it, and you won't die. That's why I look like this and still eat carbs. Anyway, so um, yeah, that's great, right? So. Views change the whole time. View changes the whole time, and that's important because that's how, we, that's how we change and improve ourselves. And now, all of a sudden, we're all in on open source, right? Total view shift in, in not even 10 years' time, the complete flip, a 180. Wanted to say 360, but then I'm doing a Soki, and I know I'm from Pretoria, and that's bad. Anyway, so yeah. And then revolutionary, right? Microsoft is bringing SQL Server to Linux 2016. And we've heard through some independent people, and uh, we can probably go find out at the Microsoft stand, that SQL Server's performance on Linux is faster in some cases than on Windows, which is <laughs> so cool. Anyway, <laughs> yay. It's looking good, guys. It's looking good, right? So yeah, and then, yeah, later on, Red Hat becomes the first $2 billion open source company. Who would have thought that? Right, that's a lot of money. Okay, and then Microsoft year, just a little bit of time on, like October 2017. Yeah, 40% of the VMs on Azure running Linux, right? Traction because of commitments to openness and things like that. Now, Microsoft acquired GitHub for $7.5 billion. That's a lot of money, right? And that happened also in 2018, right? Now, remember that, that Nat Friedman guy I spoke to you about? Yeah, that guy? He's now the CEO of GitHub, right? Had a long legacy with, with Novell and open source and Zimian and things like that, and he's heading up that whole GitHub thing, and that's a very important thing for us to remember because these guys are really committed. They're not just paying lip service to open source. They're making improvements and consistent choices to make sure that yeah, the product still works in the same way. Now, obviously, GitHub is not open source, and we like GitLab and things like that, 
but yeah, it gets obviously the, the second coming for Linus Torvalds. If you don't know, Linus Torvalds invented Linux and he also invented Git. And I think Git's being used by more organizations than Linux. Does that sound accurate? I don't know. Maybe not. I'm sorry for the guys who use CVS. Um, sorry to blow your mind. Yeah, so yeah, he's the CEO. Okay, and then obviously later on 2018, SUSE acquires itself back, becomes an independent company, and then yeah, Microsoft says like, listen, yeah, most of Azure is Linux now, most of it, and I don't have precise numbers, and we can, we can find out from our Microsoft friends, right? So yeah, and then this happened, and then everybody, I remember when this came, I was, I was, it was last year, so it can't be that bad, when the announcement came, and it obviously closed this year, but yeah, $34 billion, I guess Linux and open source is a big thing now, <laughs> right? I think, I, think, I think we can kind of say that our way of thinking and have, has changed over the years, and we won, okay? I think we won. <laughs> is that okay? Can we say that? I think we won, right? So today, we still, we still have choice, right? And ultimately, how does it relate today, right? We, Linux, uh, <laughs> Linux has kind of just become like, the cloud is Linux, and the Linux is the cloud, and everybody thinks like half of that's cloud. I don't know who runs Microsoft in the cloud. Maybe services-wise, but I don't know of anybody, I I, I'm not gonna, my brain says stop talking, so I'm listening to it. Like, Linux has become a drop-down option on cloud environments, an uh, option. It's like, remember when you had to configure XORG to get your graphics to work? I don't know if any of you had to do that, but it was a pain in the ass, right? Now you deploy a VM in three seconds, and it's up, you log in. Then you carry on with your workload. This is, this is how Linux has evolved, right? It's in four seconds, you have a complete operating system configured in the specific way, the way that you want, and Linux has become the drop down, the de facto standard almost to say like that, yeah. But Linux also becomes invisible. And this is a big problem for me, right? Because I fought long and hard to make sure that everybody knows about it. Now it's just becoming nothing, right? Just becomes a, just becomes a thing my app runs on, right? <laughs> it's like Kubernetes. It's just a service, a blank, blank thing. Ooh, someone, this Windows thing, and it just made a pop-up. Um, sorry. I'm easily distracted. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so now all the clouds, they say they come with Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is probably the next big open source thing that everybody's talking about and have some uh, strong opinions about, right? Yeah, they would be memes. Yeah, if I could make a, make a K8, K Kubernetes cluster, that would be great, right? Uh, I like memes. Installed Kubernetes yet, right? So install that cube config thing, now what, right? Great, you gotta have more YAML. I have to put that in, sorry. <laughs> okay, and may the pods be ever in your favor, right? So um, Kubernetes is a big thing, right? But it's still powered by Linux at the back, right? Core fundamental open source technologies power this thing that people say is the new, the new thing, probably for the next two years, and then it's something else. So yeah, so everything comes with Kubernetes. All the clouds have Kubernetes. It's, it's great, right? But the problem is that we have is, is it brings us to the next level. If Linux becomes the invisible layer, right, we have a new level of lock-in because with vendor lock-in, it's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's terrible. So yeah, it's never just Kubernetes that you get at these cloud environments. You also get a little bit extra, a single sign-on method or a AWS load balancer or something extra that just locks you more into that environment. And it's not a true fluid environment, the stuff that we could easily switch between like we spoke about initially. So it's story time. Look at my glasses, right? I broke my glasses on Friday having, um, having lunch with a friend. I was pushing it, not that you're supposed to do, and it broke, it broke, the arm broke off, and I thought like, what a crap day to go blind, right? <laughs> and um, it, it was just like, yeah, I can't see without my glasses, now I have to walk around in Brooklyn Mall, feeling, feeling I stay in Pretoria, I'm wearing shoes today. Um, so yeah, it was crazy, right? So we walked around getting to that uh, optometrist, and you know, like, uh, it's, 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 it's the beginning of the month, all the debit orders went off, I'm broke, right? I'm technically, I'm broke. The bank says I still have a house, but at any moment, it can be taken away, right? So, not true, but I don't tell my wife that. Um, but it's, yeah, but yeah, at any point, things can go bad. So now I have to go for an eye test, I have to get glasses. It's ridiculous, right? And glasses have been around for a long time, right? 
uh, like the first optical like thing that was made to help you see was like in Egyptian times, 900 and something years ago. Glasses is not supposed to be proprietary, right? <laughs> but anyway, you know, I don't know how many of you wear glasses, but glasses aren't a cheap thing, right? But they should be, damn it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I get, I, I'm, I'm cheap. My kids know that, right? So our eye test is 90 rand, right? 90 rand. But how much do you think glasses costs? No, like money, money, money. So I'm like, yeah, what, what, what glasses do I want? I just want two pieces of plastic with glass in between, right? Surely that's not too hard. It's like, anyway. But what happens is at the optometrist, is like, yeah, so I see you're buying glasses. What brand would you like? Like, yeah, the, the thing that goes on your face, right? That, that brand, <laughs> right? And the thing is that they cross-sell you. Do you want anti-glare? Do you want anti-scratch? I'm like, yeah. Do you want anti-static? I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to go like this and pick up stuff with my glasses. So it's like they cross-sell you on a lot of little things, and then you end up with an exorbitant price on something that is not supposed to cost that much. And that's exactly what cloud vendors do. They're like, this is a Linux VM in the sky, right? It's not supposed to cost an arm and a leg, but they cross-sell you, and they lock you in with other services to make sure that actually you're getting lots of value for money. No, you're not. You're just getting locked into their platform. And that's something that we, as people that should value being free and moving around stuff, value. So yeah, it brings us to, to like a few principles of, of cloud stuff. And I'm almost done. I know I'm boring you. So, so yeah, like how do you get your data in a cloud and how do you get your data out? That's kind of like very important things here, right? Very important. How do I get my data in? How do I get my data out? Open standards versus vendor APIs, right? Are you going to lock yourself into the way that the vendor wants to do it? Or are you going to try and just implement something in an open way that's not going to lock you in? Abstraction versus service lock-in, right? So amazing tweets this weekend which I don't want to go into, but people say, like, yeah, abstraction's dumb. I'm like, no, it's not dumb. This is like abstraction saves lives, just like, yeah, just like fonts. Anyway, but, yeah, so abstraction, we have to abstract our stuff away from compute because with abstraction means we can move our workloads between clouds and we're not locked in. And how do we do that? Well, auto automate as much as possible. There's some Ansible sessions happening here. I would encourage you to just jump into that and learn, learn to automate things, right? It's very important for you to do that because with automation, it enables us to move between these platforms and not locking ourselves in. And, and automate is like, yeah, stuff like Terraform or, or Chef or, or InSpec and things like that. Yeah, and, and Ansible, obviously, and, and Puppet and, and Salt and Bash Scripts and PowerShell and, and, <laughs> and Excel macros. You don't joke. We worked with a customer who did it with Excel macros. <laughs> anyway, and if you, if you knew who they were, you would run. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, and then obviously when you're working in a, cap, uh, in, a, in a cloud environment, you have to simulate catastrophic failure. And that's not meaning dating your ex-wife's mother. This means making sure that things break, and they break in a consistent way, right? We want to make sure that when AWS gets nuked, or their president wants to build a wall, or they get wiped off the internet, that my workload can get picked up from one cloud to another in a seamless way. Thank you, lady with the sign. So, it's on in my mind, I saw a lady with a 10 sign, that means I have 10 minutes left. So yeah. So we have choices, and choices are important to us. We have to think with modular switching around. We switched, we switched so many times when we started out with Linux, right? Some of you guys are probably still on Vim, right? I don't blame you. Notepad's a great product, right? I'm joking. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but the question is, is it open? Right, and this is the question that we have to ask. Are the things that we use open? Are they documented well? Can we switch between things? Can we move, right? But the question we should really ask is, are we open? Or we open to change? Because that is the fundamental thing of our community, right? I've heard the conversation when we switched from, from inner D to system D. 
It was hard. People cried a lot. But without System D, we wouldn't have containers or containers in the way that we have today, stuff like Docker and things like that, Kubernetes in that way. We wouldn't have had that technology. So we need to be open to change. This is why this is a great story for me for like IBM. Nobody judged IBM in the beginning of the 2000s investing a billion dollars in Linux then. And then obviously where they are today by acquiring one of the biggest open source vendors. People judged Microsoft in the beginning because they were like, yeah, they were ugly with us and they said a lot of naughty things. But people change. <laughs> this is, this, well, thank goodness, right? Otherwise, we would have the Spanish Inquisition there trying to chop my head off because I'm wearing a floral short. Josh, <laughs> I gave it away. <laughs> yeah, today I'm wearing shorts under this. Anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> that's a different kind of chop. That's a different kind of story. Um, so yeah, so we have to be open. We have to be open to the community. We have to embrace our new friends. We have to let them in. We have to greet them like we greeted one another this morning. We don't know. There could be a guy that's here secretly from an undisclosed organization like Oracle. And then you could have met him and you could have just shaked his hand. You wouldn't know. But the big thing is for us to reach out and greet people and welcome them in this community. And that means we have to change the way that we do things. We're not all just neck beards and fat guys. I'm describing half of Pretoria. But again, um, we're not just that, right? Our community must be more inclusive. And we need to welcome everybody with the same stuff. The same love. Sorry, not stuff. Yeah, so our community's got bigger, right? That's the deal. Right, Linux is in every pocket. The year of the Linux desktop is never going to happen because it's in your pocket, right? Um, yeah, so we have new friends. So with this, do we have any questions? Do I have five minutes left? Statements. We need statements. There must be somebody that's saying I'm talking crap. Anybody? Anybody? Okay, now you can clap hands for me. <laughs> Yay! I'm done. Thank you.